couple of weeks ago on the Ottoman decision to enter the First World War inside of Germany, uh, which was a day that shook the world largely because of um, reverberations that have um, the consequences of that decision that have echoed down to this day and very much inform what we see in the news headlines every night. And this talk is similar. So we're going to be looking at a revolutional event that took place 30 years ago, but uh, more than 30 years ago, but nonetheless, which echoes down to this day. And it's very important for understanding what uh, is going on in our world. Um, so before I get to that, uh, just a few um, reminders. The assignment you'll be writing based on this lecture is a repeat of last week's assignment, uh, day seven. In other words, a uh, 900-word piece, uh, which focuses, again, there's a comparative dimension here, so you're looking at the main arguments, the key ideas in the lecture, and the reading. In this case, two additional readings, like last time. And uh, the focus is key ideas, but in particular, ideas about causality and contingency. In other words, what caused the event to happen, and what were those contingent factors? How would that event have been different if one thing had changed? One element, one factor in the process had been different or absent. Um, the role of accident, the role of personality, how perhaps did one individual um, shape an event uh, that might have turned out otherwise had that individual been absent. So remember, it's a comparative exercise focused on the lecture and the reading. Um, just in, in connection with that, um, as part of understanding the event itself, I think today you're going to get an excellent background, you get excellent context for the event. Um, but when you're writing your paper, it's certainly not wrong to consult outside sources, um, perhaps reference works, uh, to get a better sense of the event itself, to sort of satisfy some of your curiosity. But just remember your goal is not to write a summary of the event. Your goal is not to explain what happened. We're taking it for granted that we all know what happened, or at least have a sense of what happened. Remember, it is all about the arguments. Arguments about causality, and arguments about contingency. <coughs> uh, so 900 words, and uh, same type of thing. Um, I'm going to post something on course spaces, just a sort of quick tip. So many of you are using the citation system that's outlined in the history essay style guide very well, and that's great. Um, there are always some refinements that you can uh, introduce uh, to the system. So um, I'll just post uh, some quick tips on course spaces about how to, uh, things to look for. Uh, I guess common, common pitfalls that I've noticed in, um, in uh, reading some of your papers. So just, uh, and I'll point to places in the history essay style guide which again is available online for this class. Places in the history essay style guide where you can uh, look to find out how to do this work. This is sort of part of a bit of, I guess, a, a training in how um, we handle documentation in the humanities, in particular in, in history. And it's a sort of a, it's a good exercise, not only because uh, it's a set of guidelines which can be useful for you in other courses, um, but also it's an exercise in sort of Producing written work that conforms to certain standards. So whether you go on to other fields, um, to the law, to the education, to conduct in other disciplines, to work in government and public service, um, you will be called upon to write according to certain standards and also to document things according to certain standards. So being able to figure out what those are and apply them is a good, uh, a good defense for So um, so anyway, I'll just give you some tips about things that I see. Uh, Um, so, let me introduce our speaker for today. Our, our lecturer today is Dr. Andrew Render. Uh, Dr. Render is our specialist in the history and politics of the Middle East and in modern world history and history of world religions. He's cross point in history and and the religious studies program. So he's, he's, uh, he has a foot, three feet I guess, um, in, uh, in different 
Um, so he's actually been teaching for years since 2001. Uh, and before he um, turned to history, he was a priest of uh, law. Um, and he's uh, but he's now a historian, a scientist, and um, in addition to a long list of publications on um, uh, questions related to religion and politics in the Middle East, um, Dr. Render has also uh, been an accomplished teacher uh, since 2001. He's been, a couple of years ago, he received uh, one of our prestigious teaching awards, the William Sherwin Alumni Award for Excellence in Teaching. And another thing that's notable about Dr. Render is that he may in fact have coordinated the Forum. Um, he appears frequently as an expert, consulted by journalists such as the BBC, the Daily Mail, he's been on CFACs here in Victoria and in Nova Scotia. Um, as is not uncommon these days when issues in the Middle East arise which require expert explanation and insight, Dr. Render is one of the first people that uh, journalists in Victoria or internationally uh, consult. Um, he's teaching a couple of different courses that might interest you. Uh, if you like what you hear today, if you're interested in uh, history, in the interplay of religion and politics in modern world history, um, there are a couple of things you might want to keep an eye on. Uh, Dr. Render is teaching a world history course uh, next term, 1945-1950. Um, he's also currently teaching a seminar um, on religion and the state in the modern Middle East. Um, and next term, he's teaching a political science course, which is also related to politics, and a course on religion and the law in religious studies and history. Uh, next year, he'll be teaching courses on the Middle East, and also perhaps a seminar on World revolutions. If you like in some of the revolutions you've heard about in this course, you want to pursue that, um, that would be a great course to pursue. Um, as with the other instructors, I'll be putting the paper on the course spaces so you can start thinking about what you want to do next year. That will be a good checkout. So without further ado, here's Leonard. Thanks so much. Hi everyone. Thank you so much to Professor Cook for the privilege of coming in and joining you today. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, I was saying to a few folks in the room before the class started, 8.30 the day after reading break, it's amazing to have everyone here. So thank you so much for being here. You know, I was really struck in listening to Professor Cook start class. I was struck by how relevant in the context of this topic are some of the instructions that he was giving you on this, I imagine, response paper, let's call it, that's coming after this particular lecture. Because, for one thing, the reverberations of this particular day that shook the world are indeed enormous and enduring at the very moment that we live in the world today. Iran is one of the most significant countries in the world, culturally, geostrategically, it has a major impact in terms of the sorts of unfolding events that you hear about in the Middle East today, like the Syrian civil war, the conflict involving ISIS. You are probably aware, of course, of the recent nuclear agreement between Iran and the P5 plus one about the uh, suspected nuclear program that many world powers believe Iran to have been working on. So indeed, this is a day that shook the world and continues to shake the world. And I'm also struck by the relevance of what Professor Cook was saying about the role of a key figure or figures in this day that shook the world. Certainly, the very famous, in the view of some, the infamous Shi'i Islamic cleric Ayatollah Ruola Khomeini, stands as centrally within the events concerning the Iranian Revolution as any single figure, but there are others, like the monarch who preceded him as the leader of Iran, whom we know colloquially as the Shah, and there were other important figures who had an intellectual or activist influence on the Iranian Revolution, like somebody whom I'll mention named Ali Shariati, for example. Be on the lookout for some of those names as the slides go along. And one more thing that Professor Cook mentioned that I think is really interesting to think about in your own reflection on this lecture is that question of causality and contingency. I mean, indeed, what were the amalgamated causes behind the Iranian Revolution, and did things turn out in exactly the way 
way that they were destined to? Or were there particular twists and turns that could have gone otherwise? You know, one of the most interesting points you often hear made about the Iranian Revolution, and when you want to think of how deeply contested this day that shook the world is, one of the most active debates has to do with what we should even call it. So, for example, should we call it the Iranian Revolution or the Islamic Revolution? There are those who argue for the former on the basis of the fact that it was not initially destined to be an Islamic revolution per se, even though Islamic elements were very much central, particularly as the core west around the form of Khomeini, Islamic elements were very much central in the sparking of the revolution from late 77 into early 79, it is the unfolding tumultuous events of the entirety of the year of 1979 and then into 1980, which really, really push an initially Iranian revolution more and more in the direction of a specifically Islamic revolution. So that question of causation and contingency is, I think, really, really important here. So all of that just by way of a bit of backdrop. There's one other thing I want to say, just by way of backdrop, as you look at the title page here, um, and as I go on to the substance of the lecture itself, and it's simply that it's especially a privilege to get the chance, to, to have the chance, excuse me, to uh, discuss this topic with you, because this is a topic that's deeply meaningful to me. It's a topic in which I am deeply invested, and this is both a, a challenge and uh, an opportunity when you're thinking about what academic work it is that you're involved in. So my wife and my wife's family are Iranian. Uh, I have been fascinated in Iran and in the events surrounding the revolution ever since I was a kid growing up in Washington, D.C., or just nearby Washington, D.C., in Northern Virginia at the time of the revolution. And as the events unfolded, and so, for example, as an American, as I watched the uh, famous 444 days of TV news broadcast that you may have heard of, as Dan Rather every day would report on the hostage crisis, and this is day such and such of the captivity of the U.S. hostages in the embassy in Tehran, I wondered as a kid of seven, eight, nine, what is all this about, and how is it? that this country, which yesterday was regarded as a preeminent ally of the United States in the Middle East and Central Asia within the overall context of the Cold War, how did this country switch overnight to be demonized by the United States and, in turn, to demonize the United States as the great Satan, for example? How did this come about? Well, that's a little bit of what I am grateful to have the opportunity to discuss with you today. So the place now that I'd like to start is with this memorable image right here to kind of let us dive into the action and think about this key figure at the center of the image and the history that led up to this day. So what you see on the screen here is, in a sense, the basis for the title of this talk. February 1st, 1979, now almost 37 years ago, is the day that the Ayatollah Rola Khomeini, who at this time is in his late 70s, an influential Shi'i Islamic cleric, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means in a moment, he returns to Iran. Returns to Iran from where? Well, you can see the plane is Air France. He's returning from Paris which has been his most recent stop in what is, to this point, almost 15 years of exile that he has been forced into by the Iranian monarch, the Shah, ever since the fall of 1964. Because it was in the fall of 1964 when the Shah expelled Khomeini from the country, Khomeini went first to Turkey, then to Iraq, which is where he was for the longest period of his exile, and ultimately to Paris in the year preceding the revolution. He was expelled from Iran by the Shah because he had become the most vocal and 
powerfully influential voice against the Shah at a time when the Shah was becoming more and more dictatorial in his rule of Iran, and at a time when the Shah was aided and abetted in becoming more and more dictatorial by his alliance with key Western powers, above all the United States, which was coming to see him as a crucial ally within the context of the Cold War. Well, when Khomeini arrives back in Iran on February 1st, 1979, what it clearly indicates is that the upwelling discontent with the Shah has finally boiled over. And Khomeini arrives back just after the Shah had himself fled into exile. This day, when he's coming back down the steps of this Air France plane, and it's interesting to note, it is an Air France plane chartered by his supporters. So it was not a regularly scheduled flight, but it was chartered by his supporters for the purpose of bringing him back to lead this emerging revolution. The actual anniversary of the revolution is generally viewed as 10 days later, February 11th. 1979. Here we have this image on February 1st of this late 70s cleric returning from exile for almost 15 years, descending down the stairs of this. I also all, always find it evocative in terms of aviation history, this American maid, Boeing 747, at a time when, not coincidentally, the entire fleet of Iran Air was also American made, Boeing's owing to this tight alliance with the United States. Khomeini is coming down the stairs of the plane and look at how the officials at the bottom of the stairs are clearing a way for him. They're not necessarily rushing to embrace him. They're a bit ambivalent. What that suggests to us is at this moment, we are seeing the unfolding of a process in Iran where the Shah's army was essentially standing down. They were not going to support the Shah anymore, but they were not necessarily rushing to embrace the unknown of what might, not be, what might now be occurring. So there's this decided ambivalence that we find about this picture as well, about the people immediately meeting him on the ground on the tarmac However, there was not as much ambivalence on the part of much of the Iranian populace, given the fact that Khomeini was then greeted in the streets of Tehran by a group of people reputed to number approximately three million. So he was, to be sure, very, very popular among many Iranians at large. Very, very interesting as well to think, therefore, about what all of this symbolizes in terms of the <coughs> enduring ramifications of the revolution. And this gets back to the initial point Professor Cook made that I picked up on. I mean, here we have a revolution that occurred now almost 37 years ago. Many pundits all around the world thought it was destined to fail. I mean, how can this possibly occur? A revolution? led by an Islamic cleric in a time of secularism and modernity, quote, end quote, deeply contested words if ever there were any. So this was a revolution that many pundits who thought of themselves as modern rationalist people said, this nonsense cannot last. Well, it has. This is now a deeply enduring revolution. It is a revolution which has in many ways transformed Iran and further pushed Iran forward as one of the most influential actors in geopolitics in the world today. It is a revolution, furthermore, whose legacies are deeply, deeply contested, bitterly, bitterly fought over. When you ask people within Iran, people who are connected with Iran outside the country, what do you think of this revolution? Has it been a good thing or a bad thing? You will find a radically polarized spectrum of perspectives with every possible iteration in between. And this, of course, is true when you were to ask, if you were to ask international actors what they think of this revolution. A couple of representative positions might be the following. 
from the standpoint of the Iranian regime itself, embodied today in someone like the current supreme leader or successor to Khomeini, a fellow by the name of Ayatollah Syed Ali Khamenei. His name will appear later. If you were to ask him what is the enduring impact of this revolution, he would say, presumably, it was a heroic event that has positioned Iran at the center of what the Iranian regime today calls the axis of resistance. Resistance to what, you might ask? Well, resistance to what Iran continues to call the global arrogance. That global arrogance being, in the Iranian regime's view, Western imperialist actors. Above all, the United States, Britain, Israel, who, which is regarded by Iran as a Western imperialist actor, and quite recently, Canada has often been grouped into that category during the time of the Harper government with its deep, deep hostility towards the Iranian regime. Indeed, one of the most interesting unfolding questions for us in the community of this room is what impact will Justin Trudeau's government have in terms of Canadian-Iranian relations? Because if you follow this issue, you might know that Stephen Harper had closed down the Canadian embassy in Iran several years ago, basically severing all diplomatic ties between the two countries. So from the standpoint of Iran, countries like the United States, Canada, Britain, Israel are part of a global arrogance of imperial interests to which Iran, in the mind of the regime, continues to represent firm, indeed fierce resistance in the same way that it did almost 37 years ago. Of course, on the other side of the spectrum, if you were to ask former Prime Minister Harper, if you were to ask many influential political actors in the United States, why is it? that you demonize this country, or of course they would say, we're just calling it as we see it. Namely, this country is a rogue state. It is a dangerous supporter of terrorism. It inflames violence against the Middle East, within the Middle East. It supports, quote, terrorist, end quote, organizations like Hezbollah in Lebanon, which attack Israel. It is pursuing a covert nuclear weapons program. So from the standpoint of people like former Prime Minister Harper, many political actors within the United States, the very influential Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, from their perspective, this is a country which deserves to be demonized. It is a dangerous, dangerous, and deeply repressive country. Similarly, you find many differences of opinion among Iranians themselves, especially if they are within the Iranian emigrate community, which numbers in many millions big Iranian emigrate communities in places like Victoria and Vancouver and all around Canada and the United States, Europe, Australia, throughout the world, you find deep, deep divides of opinion over the revolutionary regime. Some arguing that it is a brutally oppressive violator of human rights systematically. Others arguing that it does try to resist the global arrogance. It is an important representative of some crucial aspects of Iranian culture. And moreover, it has fought against an alignment of global power which has tried to force this government to fail through, for example, concerted economic sanctions regimes. So to be sure, we could deeply and endlessly debate all of what is represented in this picture, both in the moment when it is unfolding and in terms of the enduring relevance that it has had for almost 37 years and presumably some time into the future. Although there are many open questions about the future with which I'll end today as well. So that's just to get us thinking about this picture. And now, let's talk a little bit about how we got to this picture. <clears throat> Before we start that process of asking how we get to this picture and what role is it that someone like Khomeini and his personal charisma and religious authority had in leading us towards the moment of February 1st, I thought it might be interesting to just put up a map of Iran just to remind ourselves of what it looks like geographically, where it is situated, 
and why its specific geographic situation is so much linked with its profound geostrategic significance in the world today. And it's also interesting to remember that this map of Iran today would have looked quite different on February 1st, 1979, in terms of who the neighboring countries were. Let me start with that. Because if you look at this map today, you see that Iran is bordered on the north by places like Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Turkmenistan. What would those three currently independent countries have been on February 1st, 1979? Yes, please. Absolutely. They were republics of the Soviet Union thereby illustrating just why the United States had invested so much strategically in Iran, because its entire northern boundary was the Soviet Union on February 1st, 1979. Similarly, around the western and eastern borders, we see great strategic significance that even if the countries are the same today as they were in 79, they nonetheless remind us of the powerful significance of the Cold War. Let's actually start on the eastern boundary. Much of Iran's eastern border is Afghanistan. And when you think of the fact that the Soviets will also end up invading Afghanistan in 1979, we can get a sense of what the interplay between the two countries is within the broader sweep of global history. One of the explanations you often see given, and I think there's much accuracy to it, for the Soviet decision to invade Afghanistan is that in trying to shore up the wavering new Marxist government in Kabul in December of 79, the Soviets were reacting against the new consolidation of Khomeini's power in Tehran, which they now viewed as a threat to the Marxist government in Afghanistan. And then, similarly, once the United States starts supporting the covert war that is on behalf of the Mujahideen against the Soviets in Afghanistan, it will demonstrate how the United States is ever more fervently trying to pursue its interests on the eastern flank of Iran now that it has lost influence within Iran. So Afghanistan, very, very important country bordering Iran. Similarly, Pakistan borders Iran in the southeast. Along the western border, we see the boundaries that illustrate to us just why Iran is so crucially significant in Middle East and broader global affairs today. <clears throat> the longest border that Iran shares with any country practically is its border with Iraq. And as you know, as you follow events today, the 12 years that have represented the chaotic aftermath of the fall of Saddam Hussein, the emergence of ISIS over the last couple of years, Iran is a bitter and one of the most powerful enemies of ISIS. And this is one of the odd convergences of interest that the United States and Canada and Iran now have that is one of the reasons also in the mix concerning the <laughs> nuclear agreement. So just a week or two ago, you saw what would have been unthinkable even in the past two years. That is, the United States and Iran sitting at the same negotiation table in Vienna, also with other powers like the Russians, debating what to do about Syria. Because Iran, given this long boundary with Iraq and also its boundary with Turkey, is one of the most significant powers with a stake in the fight against ISIS. This puts it on the same side as a country like the United States, but even as on many other issues, owing to the legacies of the revolution, the United States and Iran are still bitterly antagonistic towards one another on many other countries. Finally, also note that Iran has a very strategically significant coastline on the south of the Persian Gulf, which is where the enormous Iranian oil industry historically ships its oil out of, of course, the Iranian oil industry is now in the process of becoming resurgent, or it hasn't even really occurred yet. We see that 
prospect held out there now that the sanctions are in the process of being lifted following the nuclear agreement between major Western powers and Iran. So this map reminds us of many of those enduring significances of the revolution, as well as the ongoing geostrategic significance of this country. So now what I thought we might want to do is take a bit of a step back from all this questioning about the immediate unfolding significance of the revolution and use the following strategy as a way of thinking about what led us to the events of February 1st. Let's just start by thinking a little bit about the life of Ayatollah Ruola Khomeini, who lived a fairly long life to the age of 87 from 1902 until his death 10 years after the revolution. And after we think just a little bit about who he was and the nature of his life, what I thought we might want to do is use the years of his life as a kind of frame through which to view some of the modern Iranian history that leads up to the revolution. Much of that history, including him as an active participant, but there are particular dimensions of the history that don't necessarily involve him centrally, but which do come to overlap with him. Let me give you one of the most powerful examples of what I mean in the latter context. And it's an aspect of my discussion here with you today that really pertains to one or two of your discussion questions that Professor Cook gave you, and it's this. What we're going to find as we get into the decade or two preceding the revolution, that is the 60s and 70s, is that the revolution was not by any means fated to be an Islamic revolution. The Islamic activism of someone like Khomeini was to be sure one of the most central strands. But there were other strands. And when you hear what they were, you may be scratching your head thinking how could those activists possibly have made common cause with the cleric I just saw walking down the steps of that Air France plane, such as, for example, the Marxists, which you think of as being implacably anti-religious. Well, there is a very strong community of leftists, some of them outright Marxists, others not necessarily, but a very strong leftist community within Iran, which was also <coughs> bitterly opposed to Islam. And in fact, there will be a kind of ideological intertwining between leftism, including outright Marxism, and the Shi'i Islamic activism represented by Khomeini in what some regard as one of the most peculiar alliances imaginable between Islamic clerics who believe that Iran has become intoxicated with Western modernity, and on the other hand, the sorts of Marxists whom you might associate with the dictum of Karl Marx himself, that religion is the opiate of the masses. How can they make common cause? How can they make common cause in what some have called a powerful form of Islamic liberation theology? This is a fascinating phrase that comes up within the setting of modern Iranian history. And for any of you guys who's a student of Latin American history, you will recognize this phrase, and it might seem peculiar that the phrase liberation theology, which is so often associated with the alliance between Catholics and leftists in places like Central America, Chile, Argentina, Brazil, this concept, in a sense, can be paralleled in Iran, in this alliance between Islamic activists like Khomeini and Marxist activists. So a little bit more on that in a moment. Well, the first point that I give you about Khomeini's life really underscores why it might seem so improbable to us 
that he would make an alliance, at least an initial alliance, before he turns on the leftists and purges them. But again, I'm getting ahead of myself. But this first fact about his life, which really underscores for us why this eventual temporary alliance with the leftists might seem so improbable. Because he was born into a family of eminent Shi'i Islamic religious learning. Now, at this point, I want to just skip ahead one slide and show you an image, and then I'll come back to this slide for a moment, because this slide has to do with the question, so what do we mean by Shi'i Islam? If any of you is a Muslim yourself, or if you have studied the history of Islam, or some friends or family are Muslims, you will know that one of the basic denominational distinctions within the Islamic tradition is between Sunnis and Shia. It is analogous, and this is a very loose analogy, please do not take it too literally, but it's somewhat analogous to the distinction between Protestants and Catholics within Christianity. And the distinction <coughs> between Sunni and Shia dates back to the late 600s CE, around the year 680, there's a climactic battle in southern Iraq called the Battle of Karbala. And this is only a few decades after the emergence of the Islamic tradition through its key prophet, Muhammad. The divide between Sunni and Shia is a very complicated one. It has to do with a divergence over the question of succession. That is to say, who should succeed the prophet Muhammad and his followers as the spiritual and temporal leaders of the Islamic community. The succession crisis starts to emerge when the Prophet Muhammad dies in 632, and within 50 years, it has, in a sense, led to a full-blown civil war within the Islamic tradition. The divide between Sunni and Shia, when you study the overall sweep of Islamic history, has many, many crucial ramifications culturally, doctrinally, politically, far too many for us to be able to consider within the brief scope of what we're talking about here. But the takeaway point for us is this, that today, the Islamic Republic of Iran is generally considered to be the kind of center point of Shi'i Islam in the world. And the question is, how did it become so? Because Iran, was not always Shi'i rather than Sunni in terms of the dominant strand of Islam practice there. Iran was actually converted to Shi'ism en masse by an early leader of a dynasty that emerged in the early 1500s. The leader of this dynasty, the figure who established it, was a profoundly charismatic teenager. Somebody who by the age of 14, when he came to found this dynasty, had a deep aura of religious mysticism about him. He was allied with Turkish Sufis. And for religious and strategic reasons, as he established this new dynasty within what you would still call at this time Persia, you call it in the modern context Iran, Shah Ismail I founds the Safavid dynasty and converts Iran to Twelver Shi'i Islam. Now, in an earlier version of this lecture that I actually gave in 10 Days That Shook the World last year, I made the strategic error, because there's so much to think about, of spending about 20 minutes on the Persian history that precedes this moment. Because suffice to say, there are thousands of years of crucial Persian history. But this year, thanks to some very helpful feedback also from Professor Cook after my talk last year, I decided to just focus on the modern era because there's so much to think about. So I'll just leave you guys with the following thought. If you would like to study the Persian history that precedes the conversion to Shiism, if you'd like to study the first 800 or 900 years of Islam in Persia, and if you would like to study ancient Persia preceding that, it is well, well worth the effort. And it's, in fact, it's important to this topic because when Khomeini and the revolutionaries to overthrow the Shah, they are also remaking the nature
feature of Iranian national identity in a certain sense, but at the same time, they are building on a thousands year old, and by that I mean multiple thousands of years old tradition of Persian identity which underlies the modern Iranian state. So that's a very important part of what's going on here. Now, the reason that I switched ahead to this slide for a moment was to make the point that by the time Khomeini was born in the early 1900s, Shiism had become deeply established in Iran for about 400 years. So it now stands to reason that there would be many eminent families of Shi'i theological and philosophical and literary learning who would be part of this remaking of Iran into a seat, a world center point of Shi'i Islam. And that's the kind of family that Khomeini is born into. He quickly shows great intellectual promise and he becomes a significant teacher and scholar. In this city right here that you might have heard about in the news, Gom. Gom is a city just a little bit below Tehran in north central Iran, which is sometimes thought of as somewhat parallel to the Vatican in terms of Shi'i Islam. It is a major city center of Shi'i Islamic theology and jurisprudence that is legal thinking and philosophy. Interestingly, it is often viewed as existing in competition with another major center of Shi'i Islamic learning, the southern Iraqi city of Najan which you also see a lot about in the news today concerning matters of internal Iraqi politics and the fight against ISIS. But it stands to reason that someone like Khomeini, who actually also starts to establish early on something of a mystical bent, he's often thought of as a major practitioner of the Shi'i emphasis on what is called Irfan, I-R-F-A-N, or a mystically inclined, esoteric kind of religious learning. These are reasons why some people think of him, within the context of Iranian and early modern, uh, early modern and modern Iranian history, some people think of Khomeini as a kind of latter-day version of Shah Ismail himself, from the early 1500s, whom I just showed you on that other slide. So as a significant teacher and scholar in Gong, he has well established himself by the early 50s to early 60s. He emerges as a forceful opponent of foreign domination and the manipulation of the Shah by foreign powers. Now, who is the Shah? I've got a few later slides to give you a little bit more detail on him, but suffice to say the following at this moment. The Shah is the monarch of Iran. He is quite secularly oriented. He is engaged, as was his father, whom I'll show you a picture of in a moment. He and his father were engaged in a modernizing and westernizing state building project within Iran. That is to say, trying to build the infrastructure of Iran in order to make it a modern 20th century state. This would very often bring the Shah into conflict with Muslim clerics who believed that he was caving in to Western secularism, and it will also bring him into conflict with leftist activists because the Shah will become ever more beholden to Western imperial interests, initially those of the British, then those of the Americans, and also his development schemes, like a very well-known, again, famous or infamous, depending on your perspective, development scheme called the White Revolution, his own revolution, yet it was a revolution of economic development rather than political upheaval. It occurs during the 60s, and it is generally attributed with having led to a widening gap between rich and poor within Iran. 
whereby some people, particularly those around the Shah, become more and more fabulously wealthy through oil revenues, whereas many others become ever more destitute. As the Shah focuses more and more on urbanization, <laughs> So the growing of huge cities like Tehran at the expense of rural people who become a natural religiously conservative constituency for someone like Khomeini. So in this environment, Khomeini is emerging as a forceful opponent of foreign domination and its manipulation of the Shah. As I'll point to in a moment, the Shah <coughs> at this time is still quite a young model. He took the throne in 1941 in his early 20s after his father was deposed by the Allies during early during World War II. Again, more on that in a moment. The third major stage in Khomeini's life for the purposes of looking at the Iranian Revolution through this frame has to do with what I told you about earlier, his forced exile in 1964, when the Shah kicks him out of the country. Kicks him out of the country in response to the final straw, which is a speech of Khomeini's that I will now read a little bit of to you. And we can think more about the speech as we look at a bit more detail on this period in the 60s in a moment. This is a speech that Khomeini gives on October 27, 1964. Think of how interesting a period that is in the unfolding of the Cold War. We're now almost midway into the 60s. And it's a period when the United States is more and more insistent on turning Iran into a major strategic pillar in the Middle East and Central Asia. And what occasions Khomeini's speech is that the Shah has granted capitulatory rights to the United States, which means basically an immunity from prosecution for American officials within the country. So basically the Shah pleases the Americans by granting legal protection to, say, an American military advisor who is in the country and does something illegal. And Khomeini says the following, I cannot express the sorrow I feel in my heart. My heart is constricted. Since the day I heard of the latest developments affecting Iran, I have barely slept. I am profoundly disturbed and my heart is constricted. With sorrowful heart, I count the days until death shall come and deliver me. Iran no longer has any festival to celebrate. They have turned our festival into mourning. They have sold us. They have sold our independence, but still they light up the city and dance, referring to kind of the Shah and the opulent capitalists around him. The previous government approved this measure without telling one, and now the present government just recently introduced a bill in the Senate and settled the whole matter in a single session without breathing a word to anyone. That is, they have passed this bill in the Iranian parliament. I'll tell you a little bit more about the Iranian parliament in a moment. But they passed this bill that grants immunity to American service people. And Khomeini describes the bill in the following way. The government has shamelessly defended a scandalous measure which reduces the Iranian people to a level lower than that of an American dog. If someone runs over a dog belonging to an American, he will be prosecuted. Even if the Shah himself were to run over a dog belonging to an American, he would be prosecuted. But if an American cook runs over the Shah, the head of state, no one will have the right to interfere with him. Why? Because they wanted a loan, and America demanded this in return. This scathing indictment against the Shah and his government was the final step for the Shah, who said to Khomeini, you're out of the country. Go away and do not come back, because I will not tolerate that kind of dissension. So after his exile in 64 is prompted by this final straw, he is off living the life of a cleric and increasingly an activist in places like Najaf in Iraq and then later in Paris, 
where he develops the core idea, which will later become the basis for governance in the Islamic Republic of Iran. The notion of velayat e fatyi, or guardianship of the jurist, is an idea, a innovation in Shi'i Islamic theology and legal reasoning that Khomeini himself develops in the late 60s and early 70s. And what it is predicated on is the idea that you can have a modern republic that has elements of a representative democracy, but which at the highest level is led by a cleric. A cleric who is specifically an eminent expert in a Shi'i Islamic understanding of theology and law. That is to say, an eminent Shi'i cleric becomes the guardian jurist who sits at the top of an Islamic Republic. And this becomes the core governing concept that Khomeini will implement ultimately in the Islamic Republic of Iran, very much against the wishes of the leftists with whom he made initial cause. Again, more on this in a moment. So this idea then will become implemented in the wake of his early 1979 return to Iran. And as such, this idea will herald his leadership of the Iranian revolution and the unfolding transformation of the Iranian revolution into a religious, forgive me, this word got lost, but into a religious regime. So this is, in a sense, the frame of Khomeini's life from his birth in 1902 to his being a driving force in the Iranian Revolution. Now, in the last few minutes, let's take a more detailed look at some of the nuts and bolts of these individual periods to keep putting some more meat on the bones. So now it's interesting to think how old would Khomeini have been doing? How, how old would he have been doing? That's a very odd kind of construction. How old would he have been, and what would he have been doing? In terms of that frame we've just looked at, now as these key events are unfolding in the history of modern Iran. Well, Khomeini was born into an Iran in 1902, which was a monarchy, but it was not the monarchy governed by the Shah and his father. It was a monarchy called the Ghajar. And it was quite a weak monarchy. It was a monarchy that throughout the 19th century was very much being pressed upon within the context of the major global rivalry you might have heard of as one of the defining elements of 19th century history called the great game. That is the great game for competition between Britain and Russia over control of Central Asia. And the Qajar were very much caught in the midst of the great game constant struggle between Britain and Russia to impinge upon and exert influence over Iran. When Khomeini would have been three or four, very little kid, not very much aware of public affairs, but there were important things going on around him, there was an initial revolution within Iran, basically against the Qajar. It's referred to as the Constitutional Revolution. And it is often viewed as a founding moment for the modern Iranian state. It is when activists living within Lake Qajar, Persia, demand reforms from the monarchy and are granted a parliament. So Iran becomes, at least in part, a parliamentary system from out of the Constitutional Revolution of 1905-1906 a parliament called the Majlis, this then becomes the parliament that the Shah is able to manipulate into passing bills like the one that Khomeini excoriates in 64, but it's also the parliament 
that allows Khomeini to establish the notion of an Islamic Republic because Khomeini will be able to lead a revolution which says this country should be a parliamentary democracy. But the question is, in Khomeini's mind, who is the ultimate religious authority who lies above that parliament? But this is an important thing going on during the early period of his life that is very much about founding the modern Iranian state that he will be that he will come along and encounter and transform from within. By the mid-20s, when Khomeini is a young man, actually in seminary, learning more and more Shiite theology and law, the Qajar are overthrown by the fellow whom you might colloquially call the Shah's father, Reza Khan, who will coronate himself Reza Shah Pahlavi. That is to say, the new dynasty will be called the Pahlavis. They will replace the Qajar. The choice of name Pahlavi is extremely interesting because it is intended as a historical allusion to the form of Farsi or Persian language spoken during a great Persian dynasty called the Sassanids that preceded the Islamic conquest of Iran. In other words, the Shah's father seeks to establish a dynasty that taps into ancient Persian notions of kingship while outflanking the influence of Shi'i clerics like Khomeini's own family. So you kind of see the potential for this collision course between the Pahlavi dynasty, who is now going to engage in the project of modern state building and seeking to forge alliances with Western powers, and the Shi'i clerics. For some reason, this slide is a little bit wonky in terms of its positioning. There we go. He establishes the Pahlavi dynasty. The Pahlavi dynasty will undergo a major change about 15 or 20 years after its establishment. Lots of fascinating history here. In sum, the Shah's father is believed by the British and the Soviets to be tilting towards Hitler in the Second World War. This actually doesn't surprise us because the Shah's father was coming to develop a form of Iranian nationalism that was becoming ever more militantly nationalist, some would say proto-fascist. And so he was deposed by the British and the Soviets early during the war. They come in and occupy Iran during the war. So in the history of World War II, if you've ever heard of the Tehran Conference in the fall of 1943, when Stalin, FDR, and Churchill met in Tehran, that was possible because the Allies had basically forced Iran into the Allied camp by deposing Reza Khan Pahlavi, occupying the country, and putting his son on the throne. His son did not look like this in the early 40s. He looked like, well, maybe a lot of you guys in this room. He was in his early 20s. He was very, very young, and he was not prepared to be the monarch of Iran. And within that context, during the 40s and early 50s, there is ever more popular activism against the young monarch. There's the rise of an active Marxist movement, which formed a party called the Tude Party. And there's also the emergence of a very key leader who actually had first come into public life during the Constitutional Revolution of 1905-1906. His name is Mohammed Mosaddegh. He's the fellow on the left. He was elected Prime Minister of Iran in the early 50s. And then he did something which led to something else that became one of the preeminent grievances cited by revolutionaries in Iran like Khomeini, who said, stop allowing this country to be a tool of Western imperialists. 
What was it that happened? Mossadegh nationalized Iranian oil. That is to say, he basically went back on an earlier deal that the British had twisted the arm of the Iranians into signing, whereby Britain was given preeminent rights for exploring and developing oil in Iran. And that Iran, that oil was then controlled by a consortium called the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, the forerunner of BP, or British Petroleum. What Mossadegh says with a stroke of the pen is, no more. This is Iranian oil, not British oil. As you can imagine, the British did not like that very much. And together with the Americans, whom the British convinced that Mossadegh was a dangerous rogue actor who would become a wedge for Soviet influence to flow in, the British and American secret services colluded to overthrow Mossadegh, which they do in a coup in 1953. One of the infamous 50s and 60s episodes when the Americans, and sometimes others like the British, but in particular the Americans, overthrow regimes because they perceive that form of intervention as being necessary within the broader geopolitical context of the Cold War. The coup, as it is often called, when you refer to it by this phrase, you need no other explanation. People know what you are talking about. The coup became seen by millions and millions of Iranians as an indicator of just what had happened to this proud thousands-year-old country. It had been reduced to a tool of imperialist intrigue on the part of the Americans and the British. And in a sense, this is one of the most crucial underlying causative events for the revolution, one might argue, even though the Shah will be in power for another 25 years. Indeed, in the wake of the coup, which enables the Shah to be propped back up on the throne by the Americans and the British, now that he's not facing so many insurrectionist threats from people like Mossadegh, in the wake of the coup, the Shah also becomes more and more dictatorial. The Shah's infamous secret police, called the Savah, imprisons, tortures, and kills a wide range of anti-regime activists, ranging from Islamic clerics to members of the leftist movement. And within this environment, remember by the 50s and 60s, Khomeini is now an eminent figure within Gong, and he uses that platform to increasingly rail against the Shah in speeches like that one. And in the process, Khomeini is also intersecting now with the work of other Iranian intellectuals, like a fellow named Jalal Ali Ahmad, who argues that what has happened in Iran under the Shah is that Iran has become intoxicated by the West. And a Persian term is coined, Gadzadegi, which means West toxification, intoxicated by Western secularism and by the imperial favor held forth by the Americans and the British. As the Shah becomes ever more dictatorial and things like the White Revolution have the effect of widening the gap between rich and poor, we now see the emergence of an ever more active leftist stream. And we now see the convergence of leftist activism with Islamic activism as filtered through someone like the fellow on this slide right here, who is often thought of as the second most crucial influential intellectual behind the revolution alongside Khomeini. And that is a fellow by the name of Ali Shariani, who didn't live a long life, only 44 years, and his supporters always believed that his early demise was the work of the Shah. He died of a heart attack, but it's believed by many of his supporters that he was actually poisoned, assassinated by the Shah's secret police. Trained at the Sorbonne in Paris, 
he espoused a blending of Marxist-style revolutionary ideology with Shiism that now will propel an emerging revolution. A revolution that will really start to seem possible by 1975, when the Shah turns Iran into a one-party system. He bans all political opposition, in essence. As the gap between rich and poor is getting wider and wider, and as you had ever more active agitation from Islamic clerics and from leftists. In one of your readings that Professor Cook has given you from a journal called The Islamic Revolution at 30, you have a classic banner full of language, not a picture of the banner, but you have the language from the banner, which came to exemplify this emerging fusion between leftism and Shi'i Islamic activism, fueled by someone like Shariati, and referred to as Islamic liberation theology. So you see lines like the following. Our enemy is imperialism, capitalism, and feudalism. Islam belongs to the oppressed, not the oppressors. Oppressed of the world unite. Islam is not the opiate of the people. Islam is for equality and social justice. <laughs> Islam represents the slum dwellers, not the palace dwellers. Islam will eliminate class differences. Islam comes from the masses, not the rich. Islam will eliminate landlessness. Think of how all of this would have sounded in the 70s, in the midst of what Irvon Abrahami, the author of this article, calls a kind of third world leftist activism. And it's a very, very powerful admixture of perhaps our bedfellows, but nonetheless, potent intellectual influences that converge together and make a combustible mixture as the time becomes more and more pro propitious for revolutionary activity. The actual coming of revolution as this amalgamation of forces is welling up there's a series of events where the revolution becomes sparked, where these ideological forces burst through the opening that is created by the series of events. For example, a fire that ravaged this movie theater on the right side of the screen in the southern town of Abaddon and killed hundreds of people called the Rex Cinema Fire in August of 78, points to an unraveling of the Shah's regime. The anti-Shah activists and the Shah's regime each blamed the other for starting the fire or for allowing it to happen. Whomever was right, this became a point whereby the revolutionaries say, this regime is corrupt and doesn't give a damn about its people. By January, the Shah has fled Iran, leaving a caretaker prime minister in power, and in a couple of weeks, the first picture we looked at 50 minutes or so ago. Khomeini returns, the military stands aside, Bakhtiar, the caretaker prime minister, resigns, and February 11, 1979, marks the revolution. The unfolding of 79, therefore, attests to this deep, deep discussion over the way things went and the way they could have gone. So in March, less than two months after Khomeini returns, what he and his colleagues do is quickly call an electoral, an electoral referendum to abolish the monarchy and establish Islamic governance. In other words, it quickly moves to get the popular will on side and start the process of outflanking and purging the Marxists. By May, the influential military unit allied with Khomeini that you hear so much about today, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, is formed 
as the military guardians of the revolutionary regime. November of 79 is when the takeover of the United States Embassy and the 444-day hostage crisis begins. And December of 79 is when the Iranian Revolution fully becomes the Islamic Revolution. As Khomeini and his colleagues push through a new constitution that now having about abolished the monarchy, renames Iran the Islamic Republic of Iran. Predicated on the principle of the Fati or rule of the guardian jurist. A country that is theoretically both a democratic republic and that exists under the supreme leadership of a Shi'i Islamic cleric. I'll just finish with a couple more observations about what comes after. The revolutionary order that Khomeini and his colleagues have now managed to establish by the end of 79 and early 80 is consolidated through the turbulence of the 1980s in particular. What happens is that Saddam Hussein, newly implanted as the dictator in Iraq, invades Iran in the fall of 1980, trying to take advantage of the chaos in that country in order to gain strategic advantage. There is oil that Iraq covets at the headwaters of the Persian Gulf that they believe they can snatch from inside the Iranian part of the border, and Iraq, whose population is majority Shi'i, is, Saddam Hussein fears, ripe for revolutionary agitation from Tehran. So Saddam Hussein fears, in other words, the spreading of the revolution to Iraq. That is why he invades Iran, and that is how Iran and Iraq become ensnared in what is often referred to as the most brutal land war since World War II. The Iran-Iraq War of 1980 to 88, a war that claims hundreds of thousands of lives, that sees Iraq use, use chemical weapons. These are the charges that Saddam Hussein was actually brought up on after he was finally captured, tried, and executed in the 2000s had to do with his use of chemical weapons during the Iran-Iraq War. And this war allows Khomeini and the leaders of the now Islamic Revolution to really consolidate their authority and to hold forth the banner of now an embattled revolutionary regime which is fighting Iraq. And this becomes all the more possible for Khomeini to assert once Iraq starts getting active financial assistance from who? The United States. As the United States, now stung by the collapse of its alliance with Iran, takes on Iraq, a former Soviet client, which the Americans now see as an opportunity to build as a wedge against Iran and against the Soviets. There's much more that follows all of this, bringing us up to the present. For example, the period after Khomeini dies in 1989, and then this fellow right here, a more mid-level cleric, but a political ally of Khomeini's named Ali Khamenei, is elevated to the stature of Supreme Leader of Iran, a role that he continues to hold today almost 27 years later, but which he very much had to grow into and try to establish his presence. The growth of a domestic reform movement in the 90s by those who argue that Iran had unfortunately gone in a brutal and dictatorial direction following the revolution, which didn't need to be the case, these reformers argue. And then, of course, the unwavering hostility of the United States towards Iran, so deeply stung as the United States was by this radical shift in its Cold War geostrategy. 
After the end of the Cold War, there are, of course, more important developments in the equation, like President Bush's Axis of Evil speech in 2002, where he grouped Iran, Iraq, and North Korea into a supposed axis of bad actors who threaten world order, a statement which some saw as really almost ridiculous on its face, given that Shi'i Iran is an implacable foe of the Sunni militants of Al-Qaeda who attacked the United States in 2001 and who presumably were the inspiration for President Bush's speech. So I hope what I've done then, even if there's much, much more we could say about the follow-ons to the revolution, which I'd be very happy to talk with you about, I hope that what I've at least managed to do is contextualize February 1st itself give a sense of how that return of Khomeini and the ensuing revolution emerged, and at least a very brief glimpse of what some of its enduring significances might be in the context of contemporary affairs. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. And thank you, Professor Kirk. Thank you, Professor Kirk. So, great stuff. Uh, very excited. Thank you to get the end of the course. We can still have these connections. Um, connections with um, teams that arose or, or motifs that arose in, in Dr. Walsh's description of the French Revolution and how Congress was there.